chapter 2. Let's open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 2. And uh, we're going to enter into this, this second chapter here. This is where the excitement and the adventure of the book really start to ramp up. Chapter 1 kind of introduced the story, introduced the characters, kind of showed us what was going to be happening. And chapter 2 here is, is really where the adventure is going to start to come into play. Do you need one of the things? Yeah, I've got to right here. Oh, I think So what we're going to be, I really looked, chapter two is a really tough chapter two to split into pieces. It's one continuous story. It's one kind of block of information. And so I'm going to, I didn't think that I could do it in, well, okay, let's be honest. I knew I wouldn't be able to do it in one sermon. And so I'm going to cut it up into a, a few smaller little sections, but it's going to all be part of one idea. And so we want to keep our, our mind on that. So what we're going to read this evening is Daniel 2, 1 through 13. We're going to read 13 verses and go through these first 13 verses. So here's the thing. I know you all had a week just like I did. This was a, a unique and interesting and uh, for some people frustrating week. Some people were trapped inside. Some people lost power for a couple of days. I know that it was a, an interesting thing. But when I went to study and outline and kind of look at the text this week, I was in a very specific mood. It was after kind of the week had, had passed and I, my mind immediately went to a book, and maybe this will resonate with you, maybe not. Uh, Dr. Seuss's classic, The Cat in the Hat, okay? It starts like this, if you remember the book. The sun did not shine, it was too wet to play, so we sat in the house all that cold, cold, wet day. I sat there with Sally, we sat there, we too, and I said how I wish we had something to do. Too wet to go out, too cold to play ball, so we sat in the house and we did nothing at all. That was very much uh, our week. It was just, it was kind of a miserable experience throughout the week. Uh, but that's how I felt after the week. And so as I began to break about, apart our text for this evening, uh, I, I, I guess that, that Dr. Seuss mentality kind of infused uh, my, my study and my prep because I wrote a little uh, poem for this evening uh, for us to kind of go through the beginning of chapter two. And so it will, it will constitute our outline uh, but this is, this is what it is uh, for us tonight. The king had anxiety that wouldn't subside. The king had advisors that no help would provide. The king had such anger left unsatisfied, but the king had an ally on the inside. So that's going to be our text for uh, our structure and our outline for this evening. Uh, that's, what, that's what we're going to kind of look through. Let's go to the, the Lord in prayer. Actually, let's, let's read our text and then we'll spend a little bit of time in prayer and then we will... Uh, break this apart this evening. Uh, let's, let's, let's read first. Let's go to uh, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams that troubled him, and sleep deserted him. So the king gave orders to summon the magicians, the mediums, sorcerers, and Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. And when they came and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream and am anxious to understand it. And the Chaldeans spoke to the king, and this is a little thing we will talk about here, but your text should say something like, Aramaic begins here. And this is what the Chaldeans said, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. And the king replied to the Chaldeans, My word is final. If you don't tell me the dream and its interpretation, what's the punishment here? I just want you to say it. <laughs> It's death and it's beyond death. You will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be made a garbage dump. Yeah, verse 6. But if you make the dream and its interpretation known to me, you'll receive gifts, a reward, and great honor from me. So make the dream and its interpretation known to me. And they answered the king a second time. May the king tell the dream to his servants and we will make known the interpretation. And the king replied, I know for certain that you are trying to gain some time. Because you see that my word is final. If you don't tell me the dream, there is one decree for you. You have conspired to tell me something false or fraudulent until the situation changes. So tell me the dream and I will know that you can give me its interpretation. And in verse 10, the Chaldeans answered the king, No one on earth can make known what the king requests. 
Consequently, no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked anything like this of any magician, medium, or Chaldean. What the king is asking is so difficult that no one can make known to him except the gods whose dwelling is not with mortals. Because of this, the king became violently angry and gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree was issued that the wise men were to be executed, and they searched for whom? Daniel and his friends to execute them. I'm going to end right there. It's on a cliffhanger, but this is, we know the end of this story. Or if you don't, you're, we're going to find out the end of this story. And it's not a sad ending to the story. And so, uh, but it's a, this is a good place for us to cut. Next week we'll talk about Daniel and his humility and his, his ability to uh, go to the Lord and, and spend time with him in concentrated prayer. And he's going to receive the, the interpretation of this vision. And then we're actually going to look at the vision or the dream as a whole in the, pre, in the week after. So that's, that's our text for this evening, 2, 1 through 13. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll break this apart. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this this time. I, th- I do thank you for this week, Lord. I thank you that as as we look at the weather, we know that you are in control. You you send the seasons. You promised them in Genesis. You said it to Noah that uh, there will be springtime and harvest as long as summer and winter, as as long as this earth exists. So we we trust your promise, and we know that winter is here to show us. Lord, that that spring is coming, and it's a picture of Christ renewing dead hearts and and bringing new life into places where, uh, where winter had set in. I thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation that we have in Christ. We treasure it, and we prize the gospel message. And tonight, Lord, we want to see it in the text. And so we pray that the Holy Spirit would help us illuminate this text to our, to our heart and minds. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this time. Thank you for everyone here. Bless them, Lord, for their faithfulness. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. So this is our outline. That's what we're going to go with tonight. Let's walk through this text. Number one, the king had anxiety that wouldn't subside. The king had anxiety that wouldn't subside. I love the structure of this verse, this verse one uh, here that says, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams that troubled him and sleep deserted him. I want to show you that there's some significant irony in this, in this text right here. In the second year of his what? His reign. I love this. His reign. He was the undisputed ruler over an empire larger than the world had ever seen at this point. Now, there would be greater empires to come. Uh, Alexander the Great's empire was going to be bigger. Genghis Khan's empire would be bigger. Rome would be bigger. Eventually, the British Empire would spread ac- across the known world. But at this point, there was no empire bigger than, than Nebuchadnezzar's empire. He ruled over 19 million square miles, and he ruled over at least 200,000 people. That's the low end. They they said anywhere from 200,000 scholars say to over a million people. We don't know at that that point. So this is a lot of people. One historian noted that the Babylonians believed that kingship descended from heaven and it was a gift from the gods. So the king was divinely chosen. So they believed that the king over them was chosen by the gods to be their king. And so rightfully, if they were going to disobey the king, what did that mean? They were disobeying the gods themselves. And in fact, in some situations, the kings of Babylon were actually deified during their lifetime. So people were actually worshiping these men as if they were gods. And I think you're going to see this in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. His view of himself is pretty high. He, he has a, a very prideful view of who he is. There's going to be a point, uh, and Cole, I think we've talked about this maybe on the podcast at some point, but there's a point where Nebuchadnezzar looks out over his kingdom and says, look at all that I have built. Look at what I have done. And so this is, this is Nebuchadnezzar. His view of himself and his view of his reign is very lofty. In the second year of his reign, he's this undisputed king. He could order his soldiers at any point. He's, he, could, he could empty Babylon, order his soldiers to march out against any kingdom or empire on earth, and most likely he would succeed in conquering them. The one that he struggled to conquer was Egypt. He, he had a lot of difficulty in conquering uh, Egypt. But, but it, uh, this, this idea you get at the beginning of the verse is this potentate, this omnipotent king that no one can stand against him. But then look at the end of the verse. Look at this juxtaposition here that's really, really interesting. So in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar what had dreams that troubled him and sleep 
deserted him. I, I, I really like this. This was an enemy that he could not conquer. This, this, is, this is part of the, the process of his humiliation and his abasement. But he was, he was an en- this was an enemy who could not conquer. This was a test of his sovereignty, and he's failing it. The, the fact that everybody would always do exactly what he said, but in this moment, this was an enemy that he could not defeat. He could not force himself to get past this. There was something stronger than himself and something stronger than his empire, something he could not conquer. The word, the word troubled here is not strong enough. So when it says that, that, that these dreams troubled him, I want to hear, does your version say anything a little bit different? Bothered, okay. That's, le- that's even less than troubled, I think. Disturbing. Disturbing, okay, so that's a little bit better. It's n- bothered, troubled, it's, it's, not, it's not a strong enough word. So the word in, in Hebrew, this whole phrase, ruach paam, means his spirit was afflicted. That's, that's, that's the seer. Ruach means spirit, and, uh, and pa'am means, means afflicted or disturbed. Um, this, this word disturbed, it, it's also translated throughout the scripture as pushed or agitated or beaten persistently. So this is the idea of this is, this is wearing him down. He can't, he can't stand. It's causing him such severe anxiety that he can't function. And that's why he calls in his, his advisors. But the king had anxiety that wouldn't subside, it wouldn't subside. And this was all because of a dream. This is a series of dreams that he's having. Now, it's, it's not expressly declared here in the text. But who is the originator of this dream? It's God. God is the one giving this. This isn't a dream that's coming to him from any other means, but the Lord is giving him this dream in the same way that he gave Pharaoh in the story of Joseph uh, a dream that was going to show him the future. And that's what we're going to see here in this, in this, uh, in this text moving forward. So Daniel's going to reveal that, that God was the one who, who is giving him this, but God is the one who is troubling Nebuchadnezzar's life and sleep. And again, this is the big theme. We're going to see this theme running through the text is that God is sovereign. God is sovereign over even the most powerful kings on on this planet. And this shows us the specific truth. No matter how powerful Nebuchadnezzar was, no matter how many armies he had, no matter how how much wealth he had and slaves he had, no matter what, there was a greater, more sovereign king who rules and reigns. I don't know about you, this makes me happy. I I love when I see people like Nebuchadnezzar be brought low. I love that because there, there, there's people that look at heaven and say, I, can, I mean, this is the same, the same uh, kind of spirit uh, the people that, that were building the Tower of Babel had. We're going to build a tower and it's going to be up against the Lord. And we're going to reach the heavens and our name is going to be great. And God brought them low. And that, again, is, is what we're seeing here. But number one, the king had anxiety that wouldn't subside. Number two, the king had advisors that no help would provide. This, this is one of my favorite stories in Scripture. And I say this to you frequently. Every story that I study up often becomes my favorite in that week. But this one, too, the, the absolute inability of these guys, the failure, the epic, just utter failure of these magicians and mediums is just really, really uh, amazing. Uh, I watched a video yesterday, and uh, it's, it's two of my favorite kind of YouTube comedians, Rhett and Link. And they, uh, they had this episode where they had uh, little candies, and one of them was delicious, and one of them was disgusting. But from the outside, you couldn't see what it was. Well, they had psychics and mediums come on the show, and they, they told them which one of the candies to eat. And they said, you know, that I'm feeling something, I'm getting, a, I'm getting a sense of something, and they told them. They were wrong like five out of six times. And it just made me so happy because, you know, these are the moments that the world should look at a thing like this and say, how utterly ridiculous is it that somebody could look at a card and, and flip over a card and that would determine the course of your future? Or, or look at the stars and know what, you know, what, what sign you were born under that it's going to make any difference. It's, it's about as useful as when we go eat Chinese food and the, and the fortune cookies that you get. Uh, I mean, those, it, it just how, how silly it would be to live your life. In, in that, but these the, these mediums and these magicians. Remember last week. Well, let's let's read verses two through four. Um, 
and you're going to see in your, in your outline, it's going to, we're going to split it up a little bit because I want to talk about them. But two through four, the king gave orders to summon the magicians, medium, sorcerers, and Chaldeans to tell the king his dream. And when they came and stood before the king, he said to them, I have a dream and I'm anxious to understand it. And the Chaldeans spoke to the king and what did they say? May the king live forever. Tell us the dream and we'll interpret it. They thought this was just going to be another day in the office, right? We're going to come. It's the same as when Joseph went before Pharaoh and Pharaoh did what? He told them the dream. He said, I saw, you know, the seven uh, healthy cows being eaten by the seven sickly looking cows. And, and then Joseph gave the interpretation. This, if that would have been the case for these mediums and magicians, they would, they would have had a heyday because you could say anything. I mean, you, you could take, just like I told you guys my dream from last week and ran it through that dream interpreter. And I mean, you can make anything be anything. You can say, and, and most likely they would spin it to be something positive about the king. And, and they could have made it say whatever they wanted to. At best, these guys were con men and liars. I mean, at best. That's, that's the, the nicest thing that we can say about them. At worst, they were engaging with demonic forces. And, and I do believe that that's what happens in today's world. If there are people who, who really do communicate, you know, it, I, I don't know, I don't believe that they communicate with the dead, but if they're speaking to spirits and speaking to uh, demons, I mean, that, that is a very, very dangerous place to be. We've encountered many, many different things in Bolivia that you can feel, I mean, just the, the presence of, of demonic activity and occult practice. There's the witch's market in Tarija where we live. It's a very scary place. I mean, it's a very depressing and dark place. And even though they, they, they have two different sides of magic, how, how, they, how they look at it in Bolivia, there's, there's white magic and dark magic. White magic is things like making people fall in love with you or uh, having, having potions for good luck and different things. And I mean, we, we see that there, but I mean, at, at best they're liars. At worst, these, these men are, are Toying with demonic forces. And here's the thing I love about this church. And this is weird to love this, but if they had any connection, real connection with demons, they, the demons failed them in this moment. And I think that's really neat. That even if they did have some kind of communion with dark forces, in this moment, God blocked them. He gave, he gave them nothing. He revealed nothing to them. He allowed, I mean, they had blinders on. They could not see one detail. They got no help. And they assumed that the king, if they asked really nicely, the king was going to give them, uh, you know, the, give them the dream and they could give an interpretation. That would have been so much simpler, wouldn't it? If they could have just said, oh, yeah, this, this dream just means that things are going to go really well for you and you're going to be king over more territories. Well, that would have been very, very simple. But as we, as we see here, that's what they thought was going to happen. But Nebuchadnezzar, remember, he's unpredictable. He's volatile, and he demands that not only they give him the interpretation, but what? The dream itself. Why would he ask this? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think he. That's that's. I think that was his driving fear is that he was afraid if he told them, then they would make something up to save their lives. And yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People still do, and people spend money on it. I mean, you, you, see, you see it all over the place. So these, these, this king, he was unpredictable, and so he asked for both the dream and the interpretation. That way he would know, because I mean, that, that would be his litmus test. If they told him anything wrong, he would know it. And, and what could you do in this moment? There was no way, and given, given what the dream ends up being, of a statue with different types of material at different levels in the statue and a great stone that comes and crushes it. They would never have come up with this. I, I mean, there was, no, there was no way they would have known what was inside the king's mind. It revealed their, their fraud. It revealed who they were. And now let's go back real quick, though, because I, I don't want to miss this. One small note about verse 4, where you mm-hmm. see in parentheses this little section that says Aramaic begins here. So this is the only book in the Old Testament that includes major sections not written in Hebrew. So this is, this is the only one. It, it includes, and now there are words and phrases in different, in different 
uh, books of the Bible in different languages, but this is the only one with large sections. Aramaic is very similar to Hebrew. In fact, Jesus himself would have spoken Aramaic. That would have been the, the, the common trade language of the day. It is very similar to Hebrew, but it's different. You could kind of look at it as the parent language. So it was the root, Aramaic was the root language and Hebrew uh, came, came from it. Uh, also Arabic sprung from, from this Aramaic language. It spread across the Middle East during, during this time and then especially through uh, conquest and different things later on. And so it was the language of trade and commerce, uh, but particularly through conquest in the Babylonian and Persian empires. So chapter one and then chapter, yes, yes, sir. Yes, that would have been their main language. Um, they, they, they did speak other languages. I mean, their empire encompassed a, a, a great deal. But, but Aramaic was the trade language that could be understood from, I mean, you're talking from India all the way into the, like, you know, the reaches of uh, the Balkans and, and some of those places. So, yeah, it would have, it would have been a... Um, a yeah, uh, uh, in fact, it, uh, uh, the book of Malachi says that that um, there, are, there are children, or maybe it was in, no, 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 it was in, uh, it was in Nehemiah that, that God talked to the people and said, your children are not even learning Hebrew. They can't even read the law. That I don't know, but I'm, I'm, getting, uh, I'm getting agreement from other people, so sure. Mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. But this, uh, so you're going to see in chapter 1, and then in chapter 7 through 12 is going to be written in Hebrew, and then here in the middle from chapter 2 through chapter 6, it's written in Aramaic. Really the easiest way to understand why it's split up this way is that chapter 1 and then chapter 7 through 12 are about the nation of Israel. It's, it's about what is happening. It's, it's Jewish affairs, really. You can look at it that way. And then chapters 2 through 6 are about the world at large, about the future of all nations. And so he switches focus here. He would have spoken Aramaic in, in the Babylonian court. Uh, that would have been his language, so he'd been very familiar. He'd learned it over these last three years. And, and that's why he wrote in, in these different languages, just where the focus is. So when he's speaking in Aramaic, his focus is not on Israel. It is on, it is on the world at large or, or the Babylonian Empire in, in particular. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to see this in, 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 as, as we move on. We'll, it'll talk a little bit more about, about this. But these advisors, one of the things I want to point out in this text is that they ask twice for the king to give them his dream and to tell them the dream. That in itself was either very bold or very stupid. I mean, it's one or the other. For them, they knew that the king had a bad temper, and they're going to feel the wrath here in just a little bit, but they look at him after he had already told them no. They, they look at him, and, and they beg him one more time, please tell us the dream and its inter interpretation. I, and I was wondering why. why. What would have given them the courage to do this? It's because they had nothing to lose. Because no matter what they say, do what? Sorry. They're going to die anyway, so why not ask? And maybe he'll, maybe he'll have a moment of compassion and tell them, okay, well, I'll tell you the dream. Just give me a, an interpretation. But they knew the gig was up. They knew that if, I mean, they had a, a one in 10 billion chance of actually coming up with what his dream was. And they had to convince him. They had to work on him. They had to get him one way or another. And so you can see the, the language that they're using. Please, uh, you know, they said, long live the king. And they're trying to prove to him their loyalty to him. But, I mean, they're, they're, just, try, they're just trying to buy time. And he sees through their tactics. And he says that. Uh, let's see, look down in um, verse, let's see, verse, well, let's read verse 6. If you make the dream and its interpretation known to me, you'll receive gifts, a reward, and great honor from me. So make the dream and its interpretation known to me. So they ask again in verse 7 and verse 8, I know for certain, there it is, that you are trying to gain some time. And then he says again later in verse 9, you're conspiring to be fraudulent. You, you are, you're about to lie to me, and I know. You, and you parents, you're raising kids, you have a sixth sense about that, don't you? Like when your kids are lying to you. The good thing is we have raised um, some girls that... Uh, are really terrible liars. It's, it's really fun to watch them try to make something up, and you're just like, no, that was such a lie. <laughs> like, I know it was so comical that you're even trying to pull it past me. And then I wonder, back when I was a kid, 
did I look that bad? Was my, were my lies that bad where my parents didn't, didn't see through it? Because I thought I was a fantastic liar growing up. Uh, but it turns out I, I actually probably wasn't. And, and I learned that the more, the, the longer I have kids and, and we're raising kids, the older they get, the more I realize how, uh, how little I knew as a teenager, even though I thought I knew everything and how much my parents actually did know. Uh, interesting at the time. But so they, the, these advisors, they ask twice and they're, 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 they know the gig is up. He's not budging. He's not going to give them. He says, my word is final. I'm not going to change on this. They're trying to buy time. He's not going to budge. But this just gives the magician, that puts them, the magicians and the mediums in a precarious position. Anything they, they say is going to be wrong and there's no way they're going to guess what, what this dream was. So finally they appeal to his religion and his compassion. As you look down on there, they beg for their lives, and in verses 10 and 11, they unknowingly reveal some deep theological truth. Let's look at that, verses 10 and 11. The Chaldeans answered the king, no one where on earth can make known what the king requests. I love this. This is unknowingly theological. No one on earth. Yeah, absolutely no one on earth can, hap- can, can do this. Uh, and then so they say, consequently, no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked anything like this of any magician, medium, or Chaldean. What the king is asking is so difficult that no one can make it known to him except whom? The gods whose dwelling is not with mortals. Again, they, they, they have limited understanding of, of what the truth is and their ignorance. They, they, they think nobody on earth can do this. It's the gods alone who have this ability and little they know it is, it is God himself who has this, uh, who, who understands all of these things. I love that. Finding theological truth from people who are absolutely pagan people. Yes, ma'am. They're like crazy to him, kind of like saying, how dare you do Yeah. Again, yeah, nothing, nothing to lose. So what? Yeah, we're gonna say no, it's it's unfair that you're asking this of us. No, no king, no matter how powerful you are, it's unfair that you're asking something of us when even it, it would have to be a god that would come and reveal this truth to you. You're not playing by our rules. That's that's what. And, and Nebuchadnezzar never is. He's never gonna play by anybody's rules. He's volatile. He's gonna make things up as he goes. I love his threat of punishment. You're gonna we're gonna read about it in a little bit here is not just kill you, I'm going to tear you apart, and, and I'm, and I'm going to make your house a garbage dump. Later on, when, when we see the story of Daniel in the lion's den, I mean, we don't typically, we tell kids that part of the story, but not the end of the story, where he actually throws Daniel's enemies and their families into the lion's den. This king is, I mean, uh, well, I guess that wasn't Nebuchadnezzar at that moment, but um, here, Nebuchadnezzar just, he, he's, he's unhinged. The king had advisors, no help would provide. Number three, let's keep moving. The king had such anger that was left unsatisfied. Anger and unsatisfied are your blanks there. The king had such anger left unsatisfied. Verses five and six. Man, imagine being here and standing before the king, trembling before the king when he says this to you. My word is final. If you don't tell me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be made a garbage dump. Can you imagine just, I think... The hopelessness of this moment. I, we've got nothing. We've got no recourse. I've got nothing that I can say. I've got no words that will suffice in this moment. And then verse 12. Because of this, it says, the king, gave, the king became violently angry and gave orders to destroy all the wise men in Babylon. In these three verses, you can kind of see, I mean, he's psychotic. This is a man who is utterly unhinged. He, he zooms back and forth from threats of horrific violence to then offers of magnanimous generosity. Look at verse 6. He says in here, But if you make the dream and its interpretation known to me, you'll receive gifts, a reward, and great honor from me. I mean, he's bouncing back and forth. Uh, he, he's like a volcano, ready to explode at any moment. He's so volatile. And as we see this, these threats aren't just death. It'd be enough just to be threatened with death, but they're torture and murder. It's gruesome, and it's gory, and it's evil. In verse 12, it says he was violently angry. We're going to read in chapter 3, verse 13, that he's raging. We're going to read in chapter 3, verse 19, that he was full of fury. And partly what fuels his, his anger in all this is his own pride. He's, he's angry because he has assembled the best magicians and mediums across all of the, 
the, the, his known empire. He's brought them here. He's trained them for three years at least. They have, they have been trained in all the literature uh, of the Chaldeans. They have all of this training and background and expertise, and none of them can help him. It's his pride that, he, that is, it is wounded in this moment. These men won't do what he asks, even threatened with death, and even promised with glorious rewards. He can't find a solution to this problem, and that's, and that's where we find the, the, the issue here. Number four, I do want to end at some point tonight. The king had an ally on the inside. And I love this. This is just a precursor to what's going to happen later. In verse 13, it says, the decree was issued that the wise men were to be executed, and they searched for Daniel and his friends to execute them. I don't know why he didn't go to Daniel in the first place. He found, in the last chapter, he found Daniel and his friends to be ten times better than all the magicians and mediums in, in his empire. So why he didn't go to them first, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but uh, a because he's wacky, yeah, that's right, because he, he's unhinged, he's not thinking straight, um, lack of sleep, he's, he's making bad decisions, uh, but again, we're going to see as the story continues, it, this is just more confirmation of the fact that God is blessing Daniel above and beyond. He is ten times better, he's a hundred times better than any of these magicians and the mediums that we see, uh, because we know from chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Daniel understood visions and dreams of every kind. He should have gone to Daniel first, all right? Uh, so we're going to end here at a cliffhanger, but the pieces have already been put in place to solve the king's problem. He already has everything he needs. It's all right there in front of him. He just has to go to the person he has on the inside. God has planted an agent in there, and he's, that agent is going to give him what he needs in this moment. God is going to come through, not, not just for Nebuchadnezzar, really not for Nebuchadnezzar, but he's going to come through for Daniel and for his friends and for the people of Israel. He's not going to let the violent anger of a madman disrupt his sovereign plans for Babylon and for Israel. And so we, I'm going to end with this. I just want to encourage you. God is faithful and God is sovereign. Sometimes things feel like they're spiraling, spiraling out of control. Sometimes there's moments that you think, I don't, I don't know how, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's moments that you feel like more like the mediums and the magicians saying, I, I don't have a path out of this. I don't know what, what I can do. I don't know what I can say. I'm, I'm in all kinds of trouble and, and I'm not sure. But in this moment for the believer, here's our hope. We have a rock where the people of God can plant their feet and weather the storm. We have a rock that, that can sustain us through whatever the world throws at us. We can trust him and run to him tonight. So this was our outline. The king had anxiety that would not subside. The king had advisors no help would provide. The king had such anger left unsatisfied. But the king had an ally on the inside. Thank you.